Kia ora everybody, good afternoon. Today I'm joined by Dr Ian Town, the Chief Science Advisor for the Ministry of Health, who's here to talk about planning on boosters and also the ongoing global developments around Omicron. Uh, I've also got D Dr Denny Delore, who will be here to talk about uh, the Pfizer doses for 5 to 11 year olds. Uh, Dr Delore might uh, be a new face to some as we enter this new phase in immunisation for our tamariki. He's a paediatrician at the Rotorua Hospital, chairs the uh, Indigenous Child Health Working Group uh, of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians and is an honorary lecturer at the University of Auckland School of Medicine. Uh, he's been involved in giving advice on the rollout of the programme for young New Zealanders. Yesterday, Cabinet met to discuss our plan to reduce the threat of Omicron to New Zealand. Uh, as we accelerate our booster program. And we've received further advice on that overnight. Uh, Omicron is now in more than 70 countries around the world, and last week we too detected that variant at our border here in New Zealand. All evidence so far points to Omicron being the most transmissible variant yet, and public health advice suggests that soon every case coming in through our border into our managed isolation facilities will be the Omicron variant. Our immediate job right now must be to slow it down and to delay it from entering the New Zealand community for as long as we possibly can. So Cabinet has agreed to a suite of precautionary measures which I'm going to outline now. So first to boosters. We already know that boosters, uh, the booster vaccinations significantly lift an individual's immunity, reducing the spread and the severity of COVID-19. The advice from our COVID-19 technical advisory group is that shortening the period between the second dose and the booster dose of the Pfizer vaccine is an appropriate and pragmatic step that we can take in line with what other countries are doing. Data is emerging now that booster doses of Pfizer provide better protection than two doses do uh, when it comes to the Omicron variant. While it appears that two doses uh, is likely to hold a good degree of protection against severe, degrees for, uh, uh, severe disease from Omicron, a third dose is likely to offer greater protection against transmission of COVID-19 and also reducing the chance for severe infection. So yesterday, Cabinet endorsed the decision by the Director-General to reduce the time frame for people uh, to get their boosters from six months after their second dose to four months after their second dose. That means that around 3 million vaccinated New Zealanders will be eligible to get their boosters before the end of February. That's 82% of everybody who's currently fully vaccinated. The shorter time frame will start in early January. Initially, people will be able to walk into vaccination clinics and then subsequently, once the Book My Vaccine system is fully updated, later on in January, they'll be able to book in and we'll set out specific time frames for that as soon as they've been confirmed. Importantly, the schedule ensures that those who are harder to reach within our community, particularly parts of the Māori population who have only recently been fully vaccinated, they'll be able to get their booster doses before winter when the threat of the virus is at its greatest. We remain open to the science uh, and whether we reduce that gap down further uh, will be very much informed by that. Cabinet also agreed in principle that where workers are required to be vaccinated, this mandate will now also extend to booster doses. So initially, it will be for those workers who are most likely to come into contact with Omicron, our border and our health workers. They'll be required to have their boosters by the end of January, or not later than six months after their second dose for those who have only recently been fully vaccinated. It will then apply to all others covered by a vaccination mandate from the 1st of March. Already our MIQ and border and health agencies are contacting staff who are eligible for a booster, and we're seeing really encouraging uptake. Uh, as of today, 55% of our border workers eligible for a booster at six months have already had one. Uh, and of course, more people will be eligible as a result of the changing timetable. Secondly, we turn to the border. Since the start of the pandemic, we've worked really hard to provide as much certainty as we can for people who are travelling and who are needing to travel. But as everyone will appreciate, certainty is sometimes hard to offer in a very uncertain situation. Cabinet has decided to push back the date for self-isolation for those travelling from Australia from the 17th of January to the end of February so that we can accelerate the rollout of that booster programme and have as many people boosted with their vaccination before 
uh, we have people isolating at home across the international border. <clears throat> Around 3 million New Zealanders will be due to get their booster by the end of February. And assuming most of this group get their booster on time, at that point we will be far better protected from Omicron. We know that this delay will be disappointing news for those who have booked travel or who are expecting arrivals from Australia. But with the march of Omicron and New South Wales now expecting to be recording 25,000 cases a day by the end of January, opening the border in mid-January as planned simply presents too high a risk at this point. In, additional, uh, in addition, measures at the border, in addition to those measures at the border, the requirement for travellers to New Zealand to return a negative pre-departure test will reduce from 72 hours before departure to 48 hours before departure. When we introduced that requirement, uh, testing was not as widely available as, as it is now, and people should be able to get their tests within 48 hours. In terms of our MIQ stays, there are currently seven days, followed by three days of self-isolation at home with a negative day nine test. That will be extended to 10 days in managed isolation with a negative day nine test. That precautionary measure has already been in place for passengers on flights where an Omicron case has been identified. And thirdly, to the vaccination of our five to 11 year olds. Following MedSafe's approval of the paediatric dose for children aged five to 11 last week, Cabinet has confirmed that our vaccination rollout for this age group will begin on the 17th of January. We'll take the lessons from our initial rollout and we'll apply them here, including reaching more rapidly into uh, remote or hesitant communities and providing vital information to parents and caregivers as an absolute priority up front. While vaccination of children will always be a choice made by parents, I can't speak strongly enough in the interests of our collective safety for children as the last unvaccinated group in New Zealand and for the older people and more vulnerable people in their lives, particularly their grandparents, I can't speak strongly enough of the importance of vaccination. Countries around the world are now rolling out vaccinations to this age group and I want to underline that it is safe and it is necessary. Finally, to the traffic light system and the decisions uh, that we made earlier this month, which remain as they were at that time at the moment. Cabinet did confirm yesterday that in the event of community cases of Omicron, the first response will be to use the traffic light framework rather than the previous alert level settings. And moving to the COVID-19 protection framework, or the traffic light system as it's commonly known, we did signals, signal that we'd be adjusting to more of a reactive stance when it came to protective measures, and that we would apply those additional restrictions and those additional protective measures as case numbers grew and the health system came under pressure. Omicron has changed the dynamic again. Uh, when it does arrive, we expect that it will spread fast, and that's what we're seeing in other places. So to slow that spread, we may use that red traffic light setting earlier on in order to try and slow that spread. That'll give us the best chance of minimising the chances that we'd need to return to something more restrictive. It's not our intention to move to lockdowns unless that is absolutely necessary in the event of a widespread outbreak where our health system becomes under considerable strain uh, and the overall health risk becomes too much to bear. And even then, our strong preference would be for any lockdowns to be highly targeted. Faced with alternative courses of action and looking at overseas jurisdictions, Cabinet is strongly of the view that this is the best approach. By keeping Omicron out for as long as we can, we increase the likelihood that businesses can stay open and we can keep our plans for summer in place. For people who want to travel overseas or to come home, we are aware that today will not be welcome news. But it's important to set these changes out as clearly as we can, as early as we can, so that people do have time to consider their plans. As COVID-19 keeps throwing new curveballs in our direction, we have to respond in a way that continues to protect the lives and livelihoods of New Zealanders and avoids putting in place restrictions and lockdowns unless they are absolutely necessary. While I know everybody wants certainty, certainty has been a rare commodity for the whole globe through the entirety of this pandemic. What I can say with certainty this afternoon is that we've got a system that's been built to adapt to new challenges and one that will go the distance. Today we further strengthen the settings which will continue to carry us through the next wave of challenges around COVID-19 that we expect Omicron 
to throw up. I'll now go to Dr. Town, then Dr. Delore, and then we'll open up for your questions. Thank you very much, Minister Tina Koto Katoa. As chair of the COVID-19 Vaccine Technical Advisory Group, or CVTAG, as we call it, I want to first shout out to the members of that group, an extraordinary group of scientists and clinicians from around New Zealand. They have had over 39 formal meetings and produced 28 pieces of formal advice to the Director General. A big shout out to them and also other members of our other technical advisory groups that have played such an important part in helping uh, the government chart the course through this challenging period. So as the Minister has said, in the light of experience overseas and emerging evidence with Omicron, the Director General has recommended that the, the interval be between uh, the second dose and the booster dose be advanced to four months. This is to ensure that everybody has the opportunity for a booster dose before winter next year. We've recommended as a committee that that booster should be offered to adults 18 years or over after the completion of that primary two-dose two dose course. Priority, of course, as it was in the initial rollout, should be for those at risk of exposure to COVID-19 or at risk of severe disease once contracting COVID-19. So this includes particularly Māori and Pacific peoples, those aged 65 years and older, and those with pre-existing medical conditions that puts them at higher risk from severe outcomes. Just thinking about our elderly, since the start of the pandemic, there have been over 600, oh, rather, excuse me, rather over 900 people aged 60 or over diagnosed with COVID-19. And in this more recent outbreak that started in August, just over 500 cases have been uh, documented in those over 60 years of age. As you know, our Māori population has accounted for a high proportion of cases in the current outbreak. So improving vaccination rates and the addition of a booster is the best way we can protect this population. Our frontline border and healthcare workers are also a top priority as they were in the early part of the Pfizer rollout. And so the addition of that booster is the best way we can protect them, particularly with the cases appearing in MIQ over the last week or so. So because we started our rollout in that group, our border workers, healthcare workers, and of course older people and those, as I've mentioned, with pre-existing conditions, are in fact already eligible for a booster. We're in a good position now across the country with 95% of people over 65 fully vaccinated, including high rates for Māori and Pacific. District health boards have active outreach for boosters to residents in age residential care who are also at greater risk and are planning for vaccinations to be offered for new residents who move in over the coming weeks and months. So far here in New Zealand, over 216,000 booster doses have already been administered. That's around 60% of those who are currently eligible. The Ministry has advised that boosters for people aged 18 years and over who have had their second dose at least four months ago will be available in the new year. Thank you, and I'll hand over to Dr. Delore. Uh, tēnā koe, Dr. Town. Uh, tēnā koe, Minister Hickmans. Uh, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, the Māori paediatricians that I've been working with welcome the government's decision uh, to make the paediatric vaccine available for Tamariki, aged 5 to 11 years. Uh, this is an important decision, particularly for Tamariki Māori, who would likely bear a disproportionate burden of this disease without the protection of vaccination. Uh, we believe Tamariki Māori have a right to be protected against COVID-19, and they have a right to participate in the wider protection of their communities. Māori paediatricians have provided technical advice in the lead-up to this decision, along with other Māori health professionals and Māori organisations. We've specified that a successful vaccination programme for 5 to 11-year-olds will be a programme for Fano, one that allows parents and caregivers to receive reliable information and discuss that information with people they trust. One that encourages uh, effectively, uh, sorry, engages effectively with whānau of tamariki with disabilities. 
one that allows whānau to access other vaccines on the routine vaccination schedule, and COVID boosters for young people and uh, adults. A successful program will be delivered in partnership with iwi and Māori health providers, including sharing of data. Māori and Pacific organisations have already demonstrated that they know how to deliver vaccination programmes effectively in their own communities. As Māori paediatricians, we're encouraged to see the government making a commitment to buy Māori for Māori input, including ongoing technical and implementation communications and delivery of vaccinations. And we look forward to immunisations for Tamariki starting on 17th of November. Uh, kia koe, tarako. Minister, back to you, Minister. Kia ora, thank you. All right, we'll open up for questions now. Uh, Oh, let's start over here. Yeah. Why aren't Tamariki Māori being prioritised in this rollout? Um, we are fortunate that we will have enough supply uh, of the vaccine when it arrives to be able to start everybody all at the same time. Um, what I indicated before, though, I think learning from our, our experience with the adult rollout, I think we need to make sure that we're devoting specific dedicated resource to reaching into those harder to reach communities, particularly some of our more remote communities, and many Māori live in those more remote communities, um, earlier on in the piece rather than later on. So we know that we can make these vaccines uh, available widely right, at, right from the beginning. We won't have to ration, if you like, as we did with the adult rollout. And that means that where we focus our additional resource, so that surge resource, we can make sure that we're we're reaching into those communities that we know we need to do better. And that does mean that uh, we'll be able to do that earlier on, like right from the beginning, and I think that will allow us to reach Māori earlier. A good portion of Tamariki Māori are at schools decile one to decile four. Why, aren't, uh, why isn't the vaccine programme going to be rolled out into these schools? We, we will be um, look, working w alongside schools. What we're not saying is that we're going to do it in every school, because in some schools that wouldn't make any sense. If you're in a, a highly urban area where there's you know, vaccination clinics everywhere and it's not hard to get vaccine, setting up additional vaccine clinics isn't necessarily the best use of that additional resource. On the other hand, in some of our smaller communities, so if you think about Northland, for example, it's a great example, sometimes the schools will be the centre of that community, and that is a good opportunity to vaccinate not just the tamariki, but also to provide the opportunity for their whānau to come in and be vaccinated. And we can also make sure that we're providing through that um, people who are informed and who can talk people through what the vaccine is and what it does and how it works, because we know that that's where some of the hesitancy in, in, in parts of the country have come from. So I think this really is a, a good opportunity now for us to not just reach the tamariki, but also reach into some of the adults who may not have been vaccinated yet either. This tribunal report has found that the, the government and the vaccination rollout has actually breached the TDT or Waipangi. What's your response to that? I, look, I want to take the opportunity to study that report closely, and I obviously have not had the opportunity to do that yet. Um, I have been meeting, um, Minister Hinardi and I have been meeting with the Māori Council um, in order to try and remedy the issues that were being raised even before the tribunal report came out. Uh, we know that we don't have the vaccination rate amongst Māori that we want to have. Um, we have an opportunity with the rollout of our 5 to 11 year old vaccines to do things a little bit differently, to target those resources into those communities more quickly at the beginning without having to you know, take away from anybody else. We can do that uh, right at the beginning and I think we will definitely want to take the opportunity to do that. Turning to a highly emotive issue though, what would you say to parents who are feeling quite nervous? I think every parent is nervous when it comes to anything to do with the health of their, ch their children. I, I am a parent. I fully understand that myself. Um, but you, you've got to look at the science here. This vaccine's been rolled out widely across the, the, the globe now um, to young people. It is safe. Um, I perhaps might hand it to my experts, actually, to talk about that as to what sort of messages that they would want to convey to those parents who are reluctant. But, yeah. Uh, just in response to some of those things, what we find is when Farno have the opportunity to receive information and discuss information with people that they trust, then the uptake of the vaccine is very high. So our target as Māori paediatricians and other healthcare workers interested in children's health is to make that available to Farno to fill that void that might have been there before with the uh, correct information, reliable information from people that they trust. Um, with respect to resource allocation, 
we don't see the need for timed, because there's enough vaccine, it doesn't have to be timed for specific groups, but we do see the need for deployment of allocation of resources, which might be funding for specific communication campaigns, for example. It might be resources going to Māori health providers and iwi to make sure, I mean, they may decide for their community that using kura is the best way to implement the vaccine, vaccine rollout. But that's up to them to decide. But once they have that plan, that resources are available to them to support them to make that happen and be successful. Henry and then to New South. Can I just follow up on that, sorry? Yeah. Is, so is there money that is being ring fenced for those resources that was just mentioned, you know, specific ad campaigns and stuff like that for Māori? Well, there will absolutely be specific advertising campaigns around the paediatric um, uh, rollout. Uh, and, and, there will, and they will be targeted at those communities There'll be different messages targeted at different communities, so there will certainly be some advertising targeted at Māori there. And if, with the work that we've been doing with our Māori health providers in recent months, and you know we've continued to increase the funding available there, we'll, we'll also be providing you know dedicated resource. On the end of the MIQ uh, changes, is that is that your move that's being fed? Is that just the Australian opening data, and everything else is moving too, or are you bringing them together so that end of Feb is when you're intending to open up? To at this point, at this point, it's 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 it's, it's all together, um, but I wouldn't rule out um, further changes there to that to that second group if we needed to. Um, having said that, um, we, we we don't want to disrupt people's. Um, travel plans unless there's a very, very good reason to do that. And the reason that we've chosen that end of February date um, is because it does mean that we can have the booster campaign well through. We can be well well advanced with the, um, the rollout of the 5 to 11-year-old vaccines in terms of first doses. So all of these things add, cumulatively add to extra layers of protection. Do you think it's the um, transistability? Is it, really, um, is it really that unforeseen that Omicron will get out of MIQ sometime in January anyway? Look, uh, we'll do everything we can to keep it within MIQ, but obviously with a more highly transmissible variant, the risk continues to increase. Uh, the infection prevention and control measures that we have in place in our managed isolation facilities are very robust. Having said that, nothing is 100% effective. And so we do have to be prepared for the fact that it could make it out sooner than that. And then, you know... I, I, your reopening thinking, if, if it's out in January anyway... Look, I don't want to hold out something to people that, that may or may not happen, uh, and so I, I, I wouldn't want to speculate on that. On boosting, um, on boosting booster uptake, sorry, um, a lot of people, about 100,000 people who are eligible for the booster right now haven't had it. Um, is there a certain level of uptake that you would not be happy with by the end of February? So obviously you're saying it's somewhere you know, 80%-ish of people will be eligible by then, but probably we were like 70 or 60% have actually taken it up, right? If we look at our Delta outbreak in Auckland, you know, every percentage has, has mattered, every percentage has added, you know, and, and contributed to our efforts in Auckland there. So um, I'm not setting a hard and fast target um, in terms of where we want to be by the end of February. But what I would note is I think we're up to about 95% of eligible New Zealanders now having had a first dose and about 91% having now been had their second dose. So really I think what you can expect to see is... Um, We'll still be focused on the equity challenge around first and second doses, but most of our effort will now move to the booster campaign and to the rollout of the vaccination for children. Just being clear, with the NTMIQ, are you, when you do, you know, late Feb or maybe March, depending where things are, it's probably got to get here, right? Omicron at some point is going to get here. Are we in a position where, you know, by, by midway through next year, everyone in New Zealand will either be boosted or have had Omicron? Uh, look, I... I don't know, maybe Dr Town might want to <laughs> provide a comment on that. I'll hand that one to Dr Town. Certainly those uh, data from Australia are pretty worrying, aren't they, with that explosive nature of these outbreaks, particularly if there's a super spreader event. But I think the Minister is right. We want to hold this back for as long as we possibly can. We know that that Delta outbreak that started in August was triggered just by one incursion. Uh, and that's all it does take, of course, but the reality is that the longer we can hold it back, all of these measures that the Minister has described are starting to take effect, and the more people that have had uh, their vaccination schedule, and particularly for our adults, these boosters, the safer will be. Nothing is guaranteed, of course, and the emerging data suggests that that third dose really does help against severe disease from Omicron, so that's reassuring. Yeah the families and, and the people that are stuck in places like Australia trying to get back to New Zealand and we have 
pinned all their hopes on that, you know, January 16th, book flights and everything were ready to go, and now that's all been crushed. Look, we've been working really hard to provide as much certainty to people who need to travel and who want to come home as we possibly can, and I'm sorry that we haven't been able to meet that, that particular deadline or that particular target that we were aiming for. Uh, one of the realities, though, is that you know, COVID-19 continues to throw up new challenges for us, and that means that while we can work to provide certainty, we can't always absolutely give people certainty. Uh, that's not just something that's happening in New Zealand. It is happening around the world. Many of those countries that had you know, really enjoyed opening up again are now finding that they're having to reimpose restrictions. And so uh, you know, th I think the whole you know, globe continues to be challenged by COVID-19. But I want to acknowledge that at a personal and an individual level, whether it's people who, uh, whose businesses are affected, whether it's people whose travel plans have been affected, people who are separated from their families, you know, the, the, the cost, the personal cost of the global pandemic has been very high for some people. And what's the plan for when the first case of Omicron, you know, gets into the community? As we've indicated here, um, our, our primary focus, our first focus, is to try and delay that for as long as we possibly can so that we can get our protection rates up further through the booster vaccination campaign. We've also indicated, though, that through the traffic light framework, we would be looking uh, to use the red setting as our first response. Uh, and then, you know, as, as always, we continue to adapt and respond as we, as we learn more. And we will know more, you know, the, the, the international knowledge base around Omicron is still relatively new and it continues to grow by the day. So every day uh, that we don't have it here in New Zealand is a day that we can be better prepared and that we can have, you know, better knowledge. Any special considerations being given to sports teams uh, that are returning home sort of late jam, early February? We will have to go through our MIQ forward bookings, our group allocations and so on, uh, and look at where the pressure points are. Um, one of the things... Uh, you know, you can imagine in doing this, you know, things are moving at speed. One of the things that I will do in the next sort of 24 hours or so is work with MIQ around when we release the next wave of vouchers, because I think it's important that we do that at a time that maximises people's opportunity to take those up, if they're in Australia, for example. And it will take a little while for the airlines to reconfigure what they're doing around flights. So um, I'll be working with MIQ to make sure that we're not releasing uh, unnecessarily a whole lot of vouchers in the meantime that those people in Australia don't even get the opportunity to take up. So we'll work our way through that. Uh, look, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't uh, rule it out, but I'm also not ruling it in at this point either. Okay. Um, in light of the news yesterday about Rory Nairn's death, likely from the vaccine, do you have a message for his family? And, and what do you say about the risk of myocarditis? Uh, look, I'll hand to the technical experts to talk about the risk of myocarditis. But my overall message to all New Zealanders is that the vaccine uh, is, a, is a very safe vaccine and that the, any... Any small risk associated with the vaccine is by far outweighed by the risk of getting COVID-19. And so uh, vaccination is still absolutely the best course of action. But Dr. Town. Thank you, Minister. Yes, we were obviously deeply saddened uh, with that report. We do have the benefit, of course, of the Independent Safety Monitoring Board, which has met and I sit in on those meetings, which is helpful to, to understand their evaluation. So what they determined was exactly as the Minister has said, although this particular case was probably associated with the vaccination, it is extremely rare internationally. And the risks of getting COVID, which itself can cause myocarditis, as the Minister has said, certainly outweigh that. The boosters themselves, it's very early days, but we're, we're obviously alert and monitoring safety signals. We think it's unlikely that the booster dose would trigger myocarditis, which, as you know, is more common, in fact, after the first dose, as in the sad case. Mark. Do you have a sense, uh, you know, how confident are you that the red light setting will be enough to control Omicron? You know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like putting all of our eggs in the vaccination basket, and we know that, you know, even two doses of Pfizer, even without waning, only 35% effective against infection. One of the things that we will know more about as the coming, you know, as the coming weeks uh, go by is what the big spike in case numbers that we're seeing around the world does in terms of hospitalisation, in terms of severity of illness, and, you know, information there is still quite early. Uh, and so we indicated when we went to the traffic light system <coughs> that 
we will sort of move away from the daily case numbers being the main measure to looking at things like severity of illness, the number of people in hospital, the number of people in ICU and so on. Now, Omicron has changed the dynamic there a little bit uh, in the sense that we know that people who have, have been fully vaccinated, I have had the two doses of the vaccine, can also be getting it. And we've seen examples around the world of people who have been, you know, had those two doses getting it uh, and, and still getting sick from it. And so that's why the boosters become all the more important. But we'll know more uh, in, in coming weeks. But the main message in the meantime is that the boosters really matter. Yeah, layering more public health measures on top of it, returning to that sort of Swiss cheese approach like people like Michael Baker have, have called for? Well, I think if you look at the Swiss cheese model that we've got now, we, we do have a variety of different protections. So we've got masks, we've got, uh, you know, the traffic light, in the, within the traffic light setting, you know, there's places that you can only go if you've been fully vaccinated. There are a variety of different layers of protection, and of course, you can add, continue to add more layers of protection. What we do, what we don't necessarily want to do, and as we absolutely have to, and I'm not saying that at this point um, we're envisaging doing this, we don't want to have to go back to the alert level system. Um, it is there, as we said when we set out the traffic light framework. It's still there. It's still available for us to use, but we would only do that if we absolutely had to. <laughs> Uh, Minister, do you think now that uh, MIQ needs to be expanded or you need to look at it as more of a permanent thing given we've got another extension uh, for the use of it? We're still um, intending, of course, to have home isolation as the, as the default setting for people coming into the country. Now, that's been delayed by about six weeks from the middle of January to the end of February, but that is still what we're planning towards. Uh, <coughs> managed isolation, MIQ, for the travel across the border of the scale that we, you know, ultimately need to get back to would be incredibly huge. It would be big, really big. Uh, I think what we what we have been working towards, and we've been working towards this for some time now, is that overall kind of contingency planning for the future. So what sort of capability around managed isolation and quarantine do we need to have, not necessarily just for this pandemic, but for future pandemics? Uh, and so uh, we're, we're working our way through that. So yes, there'll be further changes there, I think is the ultimate answer. And what advice did the Cabinet get about the um, wider effects of a delay in opening the border, in particular wellbeing effects on mental health and also the economic effects on the economy? Difficult to model the, the wellbeing effects, but we do acknowledge that there are wellbeing effects, that uh, for families who are separated, uh, for people who find themselves in a place where they didn't expect to be for a prolonged period of time, the mental health and the wellbeing effects can be quite significant. And so we do very much consider that, but we also weigh that up against the you know, potential effect of a large-scale outbreak um, and the potential wellbeing effect that that could have on an even greater number of people as well. So there are no easy choices here. Uh, in terms of the economic uh, effect, we do know that there are, is an economic cost to restrictions at the border, but again, uh, the cost of that, at least in the short term, is less than the cost of, say, a level three or a level four uh, lockdown. And so the more we can do to avoid <coughs> that, the better for New Zealand. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so just on child vaccination before the school year starts, um, what sort of modelling are you seeing about you know, primary schools being used as a vector for the disease? And also, do you have, like, a minimum amount of kids that you want vaccinated? And if you don't reach that, um, would you look at potentially delaying the start of the school year? Look, I want to be absolutely clear about one one thing, which uh, you'll note I put in the statement. This We will not be making it mandatory uh, for young people to be vaccinated. Um, <clears throat> This will ultimately be a choice for their parents. It's a choice that I strongly encourage parents to take. Uh, it protects their children, it protects the family, it protects the more vulnerable in their family, including grandparents, for example, or those who may have underlying health conditions. So strongly encourage families to do that. We're not setting a target for the childhood vaccination. We just want to vaccinate as many as we can. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of water to flow under the bridge over the next month um, before, we, before we started to, to, to think about any changes to school uh, opening dates. I'm not contemplating those at the moment, though. Why not make it mandatory? Uh, look, we, we would not make it mandatory for children to be vaccinated. We haven't made it mandatory for the majority of New Zealanders to be vaccinated either, to be clear. Um, it is those who, where there's, there's a, a risk profile um, and a public health justification for doing that. What options are on the table for people who have booked flights to come home from Australia 
from the seventeenth, from the sixteenth, sorry, who, who who are now sort of in, in limbo. What options do you have for them in terms of repatriation? Like I said, we'll um, we'll be working closely with the airlines to make sure that we can align release of MIQ vouchers with flight availability. So one of the challenges, if we released a whole lot of MIQ space at the moment, and there will be pressure on MIQ given the increase to back to ten days for isolation there, but we will have still have some availability. When we release that, we want to make sure that those people who are in Australia can get access to that. Um, and of course, the emergency allocation criteria continues to be in place. So for those who you know, have a critical need to get back, they can still apply for emergency allocations. Do you have any idea of the, the, the number of rooms that you are, would, would be able to allocate to people coming home from the system? Uh, well, I can tell you that in the most recent lobby release, there were 500 rooms that didn't get taken at all. Um, so, you know, the demand has just absolutely disappeared since we made the announcement. Uh, and I expect that some of that, some, some people, will be in a position where they will just delay their plans. So, um, but there will be others uh, who, who, who there will be more pressure on. So they'll be looking to either secure a voucher or an emergency allocation. And so we'll be working with the MIQ team to release those vouchers at a time when people have a chance to be able to get them if they're travelling from Australia the point that we still don't really have much firm data or information on Omicron and how severe an, a, an outbreak could be. How dynamic is your risk assessment of it and how flexible are you to changing to, to more strict measures or less strict measures as the data becomes available? I think with all things COVID, um, I've never ruled things in or things out because we do have to be adaptable and flexible. Um, you know, things change all of the time when we're dealing with COVID-19. Sorry, I see I'd come back to you. So how concerned are you, though, about the risk of Omicron or Delta spreading throughout a school? Like, how much of a risk does a school setting pose for that? I might ask our, our experts to comment on that. Uh, we are concerned about outbreaks in schools. We know that transmission does occur between children and from children, probably less than in adults. Um, but we're certainly, you know, one of the factors considered in the decision for paediatric vaccine to be made available to children was the possibility that of outbreaks in schools and, and the virus basically circulating around schools and being a hub within communities. So definitely a consideration in the decision. And can I just ask you quickly about the border as well, because people are really disappointed that, you know, that it, it's another delay. Should people be expecting every time there's a new variant that there's going to be a delay in the border reopening? No, not necessarily. <laughs> Um, just, now, just, uh, um, what if any changes will be made to the countries designated as very high risk, considering Omicron is everywhere now? Yeah, most of those countries that were designated as very, or all those countries that were designated as very high risk off the back of the um, Omicron variant have now been reclassified as high risk. There isn't a justification any longer to treat them differently, given the rapid spread around the rest of the world. Do you guys have centres have um, Omicron in them with MIQ? Is there an Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch now or how widely spread is it across the country? I think, I think from memory, I think at least I can think of four. So it's it's pretty much across the MIQ network. And in terms of the boosted, at the moment, double jab to get into a lot of places. Can you see a point where we will have to be triple jab to get into places? Quite possibly, and the, with the vaccine certificate framework, when we when we you know release your vaccine passes, um, they've got a six month expiry on them, so that we have that opportunity to make those sorts of decisions. Minister, so will, will you look to bring five to eleven year olds into the um, vaccine pass framework? No. Uh, and secondly, uh, once very we get over ninety percent triple dosed, does that give us a uh, enough protection to be able to remove these border controls? Look, it's it's still all, you know, there's, there's still so much that's unknown, but um, we're still aiming towards that end of, now aiming towards that end of February target to be able to have self-isolation uh, in the first instance. Um, you know, we want to get to the point where we can have free movement across the border again. I don't know when that will be. It's likely that it's going to be a staged approach, um, and home isolation is likely to be the first sort of significant step in that. Um, the Waitangi Tribunal report also uh, spoke about the about Cabinet's refusal to take on official advice. Why is it that uh, the government continues to refuse to take on advice from Māori health providers or the likes of Te Rōpū Kaupapa Mate Uruta? As I've indicated to you before, we get a, a, quite a, a significant range of advice. We made the decision around the initial vaccination rollout, given the limited supply, to roll out the vaccination initially to those who were most 
at risk of getting it in the first place, so those who are working at the border, uh, those who are working in our frontline health roles, uh, and to our older population on the basis that we know, if you know from international experience, that that is where it does the most damage. Uh, and also then to those with comorbidities, so those who have underlying health conditions. So we made that sequencing decision in the context of limited supply. Now, I'm, I'm, I think we're fortunate in the, in the next phase of our rollout where we, with boosters uh, and also with um, the 5 to 11-year-old vaccines, that we won't have to ration in that way. And so we can, uh, I think, take a different approach now, which is, and, and, and it does mean that we can put equity front and centre right at the very beginning. For Dr. Delaw, you're about you're embarking on the uh, vaccination rollout for Tamariki Māori. How confident are you that the advice um, and the guidance that you're going to be giving the government will be taken on board? I think uh, the early indicators are good because uh, the findings of the um, Waitangi Tribunal, I think they are a template for us to identify the problems or um, areas that the, were deficient in previous uh, rollouts of vaccination. Um, the, a lot of Māori organisations, a lot of Māori healthcare professionals uh, who presented at the hearing for the Waitangi Tribunal, we're going to be using those findings uh, to keep the, hold the government to account, to, get, to um, form a vision for how this uh, vaccination rollout for 5 to 11 year olds can be much more successful. Yeah. Yeah. Just finally, um, we've been speaking to some hospitality workers uh, who are really up against it, they're feeling the pressure, uh, they're getting tired of the aggression of the abuse when asked for people to provide their vaccine passes. What advice do you give to these um, businesses? It's not so much advice to the businesses as a, a request of all New Zealanders. We're heading into Christmas. Relax, um, be kind, be, be, you know, be understanding of people who are doing their jobs. Um, they're not doing this because they want to, they're doing this because they're required to. And so, uh, you know, just to, to everybody else, you know, cut our hospital workers a bit of slack. Um, they're doing their jobs. Uh, it's a tough job. It's been a really tough couple of years for them. Um, and so embrace the festive season um, and show some kindness. In regards to the Waitangi Tribunal report, um, we've already gone over it in terms of why you decided to go against the advice you were given, but do you regret that decision? <laughs> As with all things COVID-19, um, there are always things that you look back on and think, I wish I had better choices when we made those decisions. Now, we made those decisions in the context of a very limited vaccination supply early on. Uh, we don't have that now, and so we're able to make different choices. And I'm absolutely confident in the choices that we're making around you know, this next vaccine rollout, that some of those equity issues that we encountered in the first part of our vaccine rollout, we can avoid them this time around. Is the government racist? No, I don't think so. A question for Dr. Tan. Um, the Gotang in, in, in South Africa, sort of the epicenter of the, their Omicron wave, seems to have turned the corner. Their cases are flattening and falling now. What do you make of that? Is, is it possible that Omicron sort of does a it spreads like wildfire and then sort of fades just as quickly? That's a really interesting question, isn't it? Probably one more for the new year. I think the situation in South Africa is really quite different to what we're seeing in Europe, particularly the UK at the moment and in Australia. There, of course, the, the number of people who have experienced COVID is very high, so they have natural immunity as well, and the vaccination will have topped that up. So I think that dynamic is very much in a previously infected population, and yes, uh, the, the initial wave seems to be flattening, but I think more worrying for us is what's happening in Europe, in Australia, and places uh, where people come to New Zealand from, because that'll be the risk that presents at our borders. All right, we might wrap up shortly, but I'll, I, Janae, I haven't had a question from you. I think you arrived late, so... Yes, I did. Um, writing the news. Um, the um, border opening, for people, New Zealanders, um, anywhere around the world other than in Australia, can you be any more specific when you think they might be able to... Um, come in without having to go, go into MIQ? So like I said, we're now aiming towards that end of February date for home isolation to be the default for those coming into the country who are New Zealand citizens who have a place where they can home isolate. So that's for people coming from Australia and other parts? Yes. Minister, do 
change the MIQ, the 7 to 10 days, um, when is that going into effect that people with MIQ now are going to have their stays? It'll there? be those who, it's prospective, so it'll be those who are arriving after um, the, after the date in which that new uh, requirement comes into effect. So there's a, we're going to go through the process of changing the order, so um, it'll be, you know, that, that will come into effect in the next couple of days, uh, and it will be for those arriving after then changes come into effect. Yeah, now we have to have a longer stay or anything. But, what if, that That's right. but what if you've got Omnicon in the MIQ facility? Then they're subject to a different set of rules, so for those uh, who are close contacts uh, of, an, of a confirmed case, then they stay for the full 10 days. Can you a little bit more about your willingness and Cabinet's willingness to... Um, use more strict measures. It seems like your overall message is basically we don't want to do lockdown at all over the summer. Even if Omicron gets out, we'll use red instead, unless uh, some drastic news about how, how, how bad Omicron is. But on the current data, would you lock down if, if you know if you, you got a, a message from from actually to tomorrow saying we found two cases of Omicron in the community? No, I down? think the, the red red traffic light framework is the is, is our go to at, at least initially. Um, and, you know, we see how things unfold from there. Question for uh, Dr Delore. Uh, has there been any advice given to the government to prioritise vaccinations for uh, tamariki uh, that was rejected? Uh, I d did you give any advice to the government um, to um, uh, essentially work even harder to get to tamariki before the rest of the population? to prioritise them? From my perspective as a Māori paediatrician, there's only a small group of us. We have given advice through the COVID technical advisory group, and it wasn't that specific, but it's certainly in our wording, is to prioritise vaccination for tamariki Māori 5 to 11. And how that happens, uh, as I said before, is not so much the timing of it, because there is plenty of vaccine available, but it's where the resources go to. Okay. And do you think the government is is uh, complying with that? Well, the, I mean, I, as I said, the, I think the indications from the government are that they are listening, that they're taking on board those lessons from previous um, vaccination rollouts. And, uh, yeah, so I, I'm positive and I'm encouraged by what I've heard from the government so far. I would point out that there are a lot of other Māori organisations who are working with the government now about what role they will play in the paediatric uh, rollout of vaccination. And I can't speak for those groups, but I'm sure that we will be hearing from those people in time. And we, and as the weeks go by towards the start of this vaccination program, uh, we'll find out more about what the government's commitment is to meet. Just finally, in, in your opinion, do you think the government's response now is still complying with the treaty principles, or is breaching? Uh, that's a, that's a hard question. I. I would like time to go through the findings of the Waitangi Tribunal. I think, you know, we there won't be a point where we say we're completely happy with the vaccine rollout for Māori. We're going to keep pushing. We're going to be looking for new ways to do things, new ways to achieve those equitable outcomes, particularly for Tamariki Māori. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Yep.